me in the call to worship. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does glorious things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the earth. May the kings of the nations bring him gifts. May all kings fall down before him, all nations give him service. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the earth. May he deliver for the needy when they call the poor and those who have no helper. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the earth. May he have pity on the weak and needy. May they be precious in his sight. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May his glory fill the earth. Our hymn is Adoration. church on Wednesday, we just kind of put it all together. I'm going to actually read from one to the other. I'm not going to read the whole thing, um, just some excerpts. 
from chapters 2 and chapters 3 of Matthew. It was in the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, that wise men, or magi, from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at the rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for, for, for from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found them, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And then, having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. The angel had warned the wise men because Herod was a little jealous of the idea that there might be another king of the Jews in Israel, for Herod was king of the Jews. So when the wise men did not come back, Herod sent his soldiers to the area around Bethlehem to see if they could capture and kill this child who was born king of the Jews. So Mary and Joseph fled to Egypt. And they stayed in Egypt several years until Herod had died. And then they came back, but they still didn't feel safe in Bethlehem, so they kept going north out of Judea into Galilee and there they settled and raised Jesus in the village of Nazareth. Many, many, many years later, Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, appeared in the wilderness of Judea proclaiming, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now John was a prophet of the old school calling the people to turn from their ways and start living out the truth of God. And saying that they were on the verge of destruction for their behavior. Even now, John would say, the axe is lying at the root of the tree. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. John also is pointing the people toward someone else, someone even more powerful than himself. And that person was going to bring judgment upon the earth and the people. Then one day, Jesus came south from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him because John knew who Jesus was. 
And John said to Jesus, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. And then John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came out of the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Beloved, to be loved, to be deeply and passionately loved. Who's on your list of beloved? Whom do you deeply and passionately love your children, grandchildren, a spouse or a partner, a lifelong friend, someone who along the way has risked much or sacrificed much for you. To whom are you beloved? Who loves you? Do you love you? Are you your own beloved? The voice from heaven affirms Jesus, names him, identifies him. You are my son, my beloved. Wow. To be God's beloved. We don't know what took Jesus to the Jordan, to John on that day. Scripture leaves us this giant hole. We don't know. We don't know. We might assume that since Jesus was born without sin, that his entire early life was great and wonderful. But we also know that Jesus experienced the full range of human emotion. What might it have been like to be the Son of God, to grow up being the Son of God? Was Jesus' young life one of struggle and and discerning of his identity, his role, his power, his calling? Did Jesus doubt who he might be or what he might be called to do? Did Jesus try to deny his calling, his identity, and just be normal, be like all of his friends, all of his neighbors? Did Jesus enter that water wondering who he was, whether he had worth? It's from the clouds that he hears that word. Beloved, you are my beloved. You are the one whom I love. I've shared with you before a short little prayer that's come to define my own prayer life and anchor my spiritual life. 
short little prayer. Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, have mercy on me, your beloved. Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, have mercy on me, your beloved. The prayer comes from my colleague, the Reverend Jeff Eddings. Jeff has the job of being a pastor and spiritual guide to pastors like me who are launching new and radical ministries like we're doing in Columbiana. Launching these type of ministries can be spiritually and physically and emotionally draining often, not luckily in my case, but often with little, little support from those in the church around them. And there's a huge amount of failure involved. So Jeff gathers us together, constantly reminding us we are God's beloved. And we push back at him. But, but, we say, we didn't do this right. We didn't do that right. We messed up here. We didn't do enough there. If only people knew what we were really like or what was really going on in our heads or what we really think or what we really believed or how much we doubted or how much we wondered they really knew our fears or our incompetences, well, they wouldn't like us very much. And Jeff pushes right back. <clears throat> remember, he tells us, remember, you are God's beloved. But, 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 we say. Another Bible story. Another voice from heaven. Light, blindness on the road between Jerusalem and Damascus. Saul, Saul, the voice says. Saul, why do you persecute me? You, Saul, who collected coats while well, they stoned my beloved Stephen. You, Saul, who had a warrant from the high priest to arrest, torture, and kill those who pray in my name. You, Saul, who in your attempt to show devotion to me are killing my beloved. You've turned to hate, to terror, to murder, why, why, why do you do this? The voice says, Why? For I love you. You, Saul, are my beloved. Many years later, Saul, now going by the Greek name Paul, would write, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, although perhaps someone might die for a good person. But God proves his love to us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Saul, Saul, Jesus says, the voice coming from heaven, you who persecute me, you are my beloved. I love you. Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, have mercy on me, your beloved. I am beloved by you. God, you created us. You birthed us. You breathed.
your holy breath. You love me. We are loved. We have worked. Who do you love? Who do you consider beloved? That's the flip side. It's nice to rest securely in this knowledge that God loves us, that we are God's beloved. But who do we love? We like making the list of who's in, the who's out, those whom we love, those whom we don't, those we think God should love, those we think God should shouldn't love. The other day on Facebook, I learned that the husband of an acquaintance of mine that I much respect has certain affiliations of which I decidedly do not approve. And immediately I transferred my acquaintance's husband to that list that we all keep the mental list, that list of those who are not beloved. Before, when I barely even knew of her husband, he wasn't on any list at all. I didn't care about him. But now I knew this thing about him, and he is on that list. And her, I began wondering. She was on this list. But she posted about her husband. So does that move her to that list? Who's worthy of our love? Who's worthy of God's love? This isn't new. Jesus' disciples had their list as well. They told and retold the story of Jesus being God's beloved, and they held that up. That line, you are my son, my beloved, of whom I am well pleased, is repeated three times in the Gospel of Matthew. They didn't care so much about the story of Paul being God's beloved. How could this man who watched with approval as stone after stone beat down on their beloved Stephen be among God's beloved. How could this man who chased them from Jerusalem to Damascus, because that's why they were in Damascus, as Paul was threatening them in Jerusalem, be among their beloved. If you read the New Testament, you begin to realize that Paul, God's beloved, spends very little time in Jerusalem among the beloved of Christ in Jerusalem, the other apostles, because they did not like him. He was not on their beloved list. Despite everything, they struggled to move him over. We like our list. Another acquaintance of mine recently showed compassion and generosity to a third mutual acquaintance. And I will confess this third mutual acquaintance is also on this list. And I was frustrated with my friend, even a little angry at my friend, because this third mutual acquaintance had actually hurt them more than the acquaintance had hurt me. But here my friend was showing generosity and compassion. This isn't a new thing. I have accosted my friend about the generosity and compassion my friend shows to this third acquaintance to which my friend just replies, we're deeply connected. Yes, she's been hurt, but this third person is still her beloved. 
she can't let them go. There's deep lines of connection between them. They are beloved despite whatever list that I wanted to put them on. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us, numbered us among his beloved. We have worth, we have value, whether we see it or not, it doesn't matter. Whether others sees it and expresses it or not doesn't matter. God's words to Jesus, God's words to Paul, those same words apply to us. And you know something? When we get into our little game of list making, God doesn't really care about that either. Just because we put someone on this list, this out list, this not beloved list, whatever our good reasons are, and trust me, my reasons are always good when someone <laughs> goes on that list. God doesn't put them there. And we shouldn't either. Because the same words that so embrace us embrace our neighbor and our enemies and just those who just frustrate the heck out of us <laughs> they too are embraced Jesus Christ Lamb of God have mercy on me your beloved and grant going to sing the great hymn of embracing just as I am without one plea. It is number 488. <laughs>
to cycle you through and guide you through several modes or directions of prayer. We start by invite you to repeat silently with me that little prayer snippet. Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, have mercy on me, your beloved. Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, have mercy on me, your beloved. Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, have mercy on me, your beloved. Now I invite you to pull up to mind any ways in the last few hours or day or so you have felt God's beloved. Those moments when in the midst of the everyday <laughs> Christ broke through and you just sensed that you belonged to God. Maybe the sun broke through the clouds in just a way. Maybe the ice sparkled on the snow. Maybe in the midst of struggle or panic or anxiety, you felt a moment of peace. Maybe someone else was Christ to you. And you were beloved by them. Bring these to his love. Now I invite you to turn your prayers to those whom you love, those whom you call Beloved, bring them to mind. Thank God for them. Say a prayer of thanksgiving, a prayer of concern. Lift them. they are your beloved. Lord, I and now I invite you to turn, and this is harder, to those who are on the other list, the list of those you'd rather not love, the list of those you'd rather God not love. And lift them. Find one thing about them that you can thank God for. That one way, maybe two, that they have blessed you. Lift them up to God, not for who 
want them to be, but for who they are. You don't necessarily have to give thanks or praise, or just lift them up to God. For they too are God's beloved. And ask God to heal that part of you that wants them on that other list. That part of you that maybe finds strength in the hate or the distrust or the distaste. Finally, I invite you to think through your life and your interactions about those who are maybe on no one's list. The invisible people. The invisible among God's beloved who you rely on, who we all rely on every day. Those faces we pass and meet and don't think the clerk in the grocery store, one of God's beloved. The person who picks up our trash, one of God's beloved. The receptionist in the doctor's office, one of God's beloved. So many people we depend upon whom we don't know God's beloved. Give thanks for them. For what they bring to your life. And finally we end where we begin. Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, have mercy on me, <clears throat> your beloved. Jesus Christ, <coughs> Lamb of God, have mercy on me, 
There are different ways of serving God, but it is the same Lord who is served. God works through each person in a unique way, but it is God's purpose that is accomplished. To each is given a gift of the Spirit to be used for the common good. Together we are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We are all called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our calling and calling to be disciples and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as elders, and as ministers of the word and sacrament. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us, providing for ministries of caring and compassion in the world, ordering the governance of the church, and preaching the word and administering the sacraments. Representing the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, the session of First Presbyterian Church now installs into active service those who have been previously ordained. Deacons Larry Fricchetti, Dave Six, Barb Unger, and Pamela Zitto, and elders Linda Forney and Randy Johnson. All who are able, please rise. Ordination calls the whole church to renewed commitment and reminds us all to bear gladly the yoke of Christ given in the covenant of baptism. Let us therefore reaffirm our baptismal vows, renouncing all that opposes God and God's rule and affirming the faith of the Holy Catholic Church. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you, those in front and those out there, turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, say, I do. Amen. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? If so, say, I do. Amen. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple? Obeying his word and showing his love. If so, say, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. Eternal and gracious God, we rejoice that you claimed us in your baptism and that by your grace we are born anew. By your Holy Spirit, renew us that we may be empowered to do your will and continue forever in the risen life of Christ to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all glory and honor, now and forever. Amen. Remember your baptism and be thankful in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. You will answer these questions. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church? And through him believe in one God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If so, say, I do. I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? If so, say, I do. I do. do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith is expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do. And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, say, I do and I will. I do. Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confession? I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, say, I will. In your own life, will you seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, say, I will. 
Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, say, I do. I do. Will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? If so, say, I will. I will. Deacons, will you be faithful deacons, teaching charity, urgent concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? In your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will. Elders, will you be faithful elders watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in governing bodies of the church and in your own ministry? Will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will. I will. Congregation, do we, the members of the church, accept Linda and Randy, Larry, Dave, Barbara, and Pam as elders and deacons, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do we? Do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Do we? To Larry and Randy, to Linda and Randy, to Larry, Dave, Barbara, and Pam, you are now continued to be in active service as elders and deacons in the Church of Jesus Christ and for this congregation. Be faithful and true in your ministry so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ. Huge thank you to all of you and to Randy for your willingness and commitment to <coughs> serve and lead and guide us in the year ahead. Thank you, and you can now be seated. And we close our service with our closing song. Go, my children, with my blessing. It's not 